Today is August 1st, 2013, and my name is Linda Arroyo Holmstrom. I am interviewing Josie Heath, who is the president of the Community Foundation of Boulder County. This interview is being recorded for the Boulder County Latino History Project and the Maria Rogers Oral History Program. The interview is being filmed by Irve Hernandez. First of all, Josie, I want to thank you so much for taking time to do this oral history with us. Um, can you tell us where you, when and where you were born? Right. I was born in San Jose, California, on September 5th, 1937. Can you, do you have any childhood memories or were there any significant influences that impacted your life as a child? Absolutely. And um, they relate to this project. Um, I, uh, I have memories of, um, I was born in California, but I grew up in Oregon. And, um, my mom was single um, in the early part of my life, and she and I uh, worked in the fields in Oregon. And um, she um, was a very hard worker and instilled in me that piece of hard work. And it was hard work because the truck would come around. We lived in a rural town in Oregon. And you'd get on this flatbed truck, and it was still dark in the morning, and ride out to the field, start out picking strawberries, and then when the strawberry season was over, we would string beans, and then, you know, you'd pick raspberries, and then when st the bean season began, you'd work there. And, well, she didn't go with me every day. She got me started, and when she could, she went with me. And I was probably maybe 10 or 11. And we... Um, it was my first experience to have, uh, we lived in a small rural part of Oregon, to have Latino families there. And they worked, right, in a little different part of the field, but they were all families. And I remember saying to my mom, where do, where do they stay? And mom said, well, they don't have a house. They just live in the cars here that are parked by the field. And as a young girl, you can imagine how I just couldn't believe that that's, they worked, it was hard work. It's hard physical work. And that they were there when we got to the field in the morning and we'd leave about four and get back in the truck bed and go back to town. And um, they kept working. And over the years, um, you know, I have these memories of you get to be kind of befriend, even though you don't, I didn't speak Spanish you kind of play around with, at the, most of the time their families didn't want their children to come where we were, but we kind of, you know, kids find each other. And then one day, my friend would be gone. And I remember saying to the field boss, where are they? And they said, they moved on. You know, crops would be better someplace else. And all of a sudden, without me even knowing it, in one day, they were gone. And it lingers with me today, I get teary, actually, um, because when I was county commissioner, I helped establish the, the, what at that time was migrant housing. It's now Casa Esperanza. I worked really hard on that project. And it was a lot about the memories of people. It just seemed like it was so um, um, unfair that they didn't have a place to go to the doctor that they didn't have a place to take a shower, um, you know, and then the uncertainty of the, especially the young girls that I came to know and like, that they had no sense of where they might be next. So it encouraged me to study Spanish, which I hadn't done before, and I did it in high school. I'm still not very um, fluent, but I, saw those folks who were in the fields as this, uh, as hardworking people who added to our economy where we lived. It was a very agricultural area. We needed them. And uh, then I just think it had, it earned a lot of respect for me about how um, beautiful they were first, how hardworking they were, 
and how much I um, was, it was a mystery to me how that life would be. So it made a huge impression on me as a young girl and I, I know it has influenced a lot of the work I do. Um, sometime I've forgotten whether it's biblical or somebody said that if you want peace work for justice and it always felt to me that the justice of people who worked so hard but had no insurance, no health care, that that was just so wrong and so I'm sure it's influenced me to be active on those issues. That is, was a very moving story, thank you. Um, when you kind of ended, it made you active. Like, what else in your, I mean, it seems like you have this amazing, illustrious life that you have given so much to the community in so many different ways. Um, can you tell us more about what made you become a woman of action, a woman who wanted change? and? Can you tell us maybe also about some of those things, that, other things that you've done in your life? Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I don't know that I think of myself that way. I feel like I think of myself as someone who cares deeply about things being fair and right. And so those things I've taken on were more about not just wanting to have action no matter what, but to really speak up when it felt like things weren't being dealt with fairly. And I think that was my barometer, whether it, there was justice in that. Um, and um, as I think back, um, certainly in um, high school and college, I was probably, you know, not a wild-eyed activist. I was going to high school in a I had a hundred people in my graduating class. I mean, we weren't like some kind of mainstream social protesters, but you, had, you carried that sense of what was right. And I was active in college, more on campus. Um, there, the, I went to college in Eastern Oregon, and uh, you know, it was again a rural setting. And so I don't think I really was even ever at a place where there were like big protests or anything until I was in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin. And then, um, you know, we married, my husband was in the army and you weren't supposed to really get involved with social activism if you were a military family. And so, you know, it kind of went along, we had our family. And, uh, but I always cared about things that just didn't seem right. And then after we, um, well, I should say, I back up one moment, I was a teacher and a counselor in El Paso, Texas, and I was the student council advisor, and we had an incident where it was when Lyndon Johnson was president, and um, the Texas Student Presidents Association was meeting in Galveston, and we were all encouraged to bring our leaders, and one of our leaders was an African-American, and so I wrote ahead to see about housing and everything, and they said, oh, you know, that we couldn't accommodate that person here. And I thought, what? You know, here's a Texas high school, and, you know, we were going to stop along the way at the Alamo, and it said, well, if you're colored, you could only tour the Alamo, like, on Tuesday. And, and all that just seemed so wrong. So we decided not to go, and... Um, and I talked to my principal about it, and we made um, kind of a statement about not going. And um, it was a, made a huge impression on me because he backed me fully as kind of a young high school counselor, teacher. And we left because my husband got transferred in the service, and that summer my principal got fired. His school board thought we had taken on something too activist. And I felt terrible because I was young, we were married, we had no family, and it was like, well, of course, that's the right thing to do. But he had three children, he lived there, he lost his job because he stood up for what we thought was right. And it made me realize that the, you know, um, even though you want to do the right thing and people sometimes align around you, there are consequences. And sometimes you don't appreciate what that means for other people who stand up, and uh, that made a big impression on me that, 
that no matter what I do, I also have to think about not everybody's able to stand up even though they want to. And that sometimes people are in a place where they're able to be courageous uh, because they, um, they're just, maybe it's a point of privilege, really, that you have the ability. And I felt like even when I was county commissioner, um, that I had a privilege where I was able to speak out for some folks who didn't have a voice. And so I think carefully about privilege, but I also believe privilege comes with responsibility. And I don't mean just privilege of money, but privilege of having the community trust you for leadership. I think that's also a privilege. And I think it's one of the most difficult things for me to think about is when people are elected to office or entrusted with an important position and then they don't use that position to do the right thing. They try to be so safe and non-confrontational and so uh, unwilling to really ever step up and be counted that that's such a lost opportunity and it makes me very sad when people don't feel that courage to do the right thing. And I know that, you know, it comes with consequences. You know, somebody should get pulled back in. <laughs> it's not always easy. Um, can you tell us more about maybe who were some of your mentors in your, in your life along mm -hmm. your career path and yes. personal path? Uh -huh. Well, when I came to Boulder, our, Raleigh and I, my husband, we came in 1970. We came for his work in Denver. And he was very involved with his job. My, our kids were little. And so he was gone a lot. And I began to be involved first at the YWCA and then at AAUW. And I began to get involved in the Democratic Party. And uh, one of the things I have to say early on, maybe in 72, I went to a caucus and there, um, they elected delegates to the county assembly. I had never done anything political. And so I went, I didn't know anybody there. And at the end of the caucus, they elected the delegates and we were all ready to go home. And one of the committee people, Paul Hagen, said, well, you know, we have all men going. We should have some women go. Um, he said, I would give up my seat if any woman would go. And I thought, well, I would like to go. And, but I didn't know him. And I thought, really? Somebody here would just do that because it was the right thing? <laughs> and I, so that really caught me. I have been a Democrat always. But that really activated me to say, you know, Maybe it was just one person, but he convinced me that there were people who wanted to just do the right thing. And then I did get very involved as a Democrat, and in that process met women who I admired, like Ruth Carell and Jean Dubofsky and Janet Roberts, and then very quickly through them met Penfield Tate and worked on his campaigns, and he eventually worked on mine. But I saw people in the move to have justice for people who were gay and saw, you know, that Penn lost um, his race probably because of that. Tim Fuller, who was a councilman who, you know, was um, very maligned because of his support there. And I began to see what I thought was this really progressive liberal community and people who took hard stands really were punished. and. And yet I admired their courage and it inspired me to want to join them. And so I, I was involved because it was the 70s and certainly the, an issue then that was very big was uh, women's equality. And I felt like, um, you know, it was hard. I was happily married and it was, you know, for my husband's friends and even for him it was like, well, are you not happy, you know? Or do you have a nice husband and why aren't you content? And, and I, it wasn't that, it was just that I felt like women's voices really needed to be heard and recognized in their own right. So I'm certain that my sense of social justice was honed on women's rights. And, you know, I feel proud that um, I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, 
I eventually chaired the Colorado Commission on Women and was shocked to learn that women couldn't have credit in their own name. And you know that if you might have had excellent credit, but your husband didn't, you know, your credit would be damaged because of his and things that I wasn't even aware of, that you couldn't get insurance in your own name on your car, that your husband had to co-sign. And even in 1982, when I was first Boulder County Commissioner, I remember so well, they made a big ceremony because at that time we signed about $80 million a year in checks. And my signature was the one on the check. So when I went over to the bank to formally put my signature on this check that would go out for everyone, it was a big deal and the bank president came and everybody came. And Jack Murphy, who was one of the county commissioners, said, when I went back, you know, I wrote him a check for lunch that we shared or something. He said, I see you, you're using the Women's Bank in Denver. You should have a Boulder County Bank. You're a Boulder County Commissioner. So I thought, gosh, you know, you're right. So while I was over there having this big ceremony, after everybody left, I said, well, you know, I'd like to open up a, an account. And they said, oh, good, are you married? And I said, yes. They said, well, we'll need your husband to sign for that. And I had just been there signing for $80 million worth of accounts for the Boulder County. And I said, well, he travels internationally. He's hardly ever here during banking hours. And they said, well, we're sorry. We couldn't open your account unless your husband came in and signed for you. And I thought, oh my gosh, we still have a lot of work to do here. I mean, that was 1982 and it's not the case now. But it just reminds you every time something like that happens that you've got to help change that. Um, I was, we're interested in knowing um, how you, your, you came about being involved or what has your involvement with the Latino mm -hmm, Boulder community mm -hmm. or Boulder County community Well, been? that definitely, I could talk about that. It came about through my work with the YWCA. And um, it was probably about the same time, maybe 1970 or 71. and. I lived in the unincorporated part of the county, really between Boulder and Lafayette. And I was thinking, we should have some classes for the Y, where we had babysitting, and you could take classes in Lafayette or in Boulder. And so I said I would help on that. And somebody said, well, if you're going to do something in Lafayette, you should talk to Eleanor Montour. And so I did, and she said, you know, uh, you should talk to my mom. And of course, Alicia Sanchez, who eventually the name, school was named for. I talked to her about it, and she said, yeah, we should have a, maybe a, a cooking class. And we could babysit the children. And we did it at the, um, I think it was uh, either Skylark Lane or the Bluebird Mobile Home Court. And uh, Alicia got some people who would be the babysitters, and she and I did the class, and we used the kitchen there. And then we got to be friends, Alicia, really, and Eleanor. And so she, Alicia was always looking for household goods for people she was helping, and I had people I thought might have things for her baby clothes or even a mattress once. I remember one time she came to my house and somebody had brought a mattress to our garage, and she and I took it. And, she, we put the mattress on the top of the car and she was holding on to it as she was driving on one side and I was on the passenger side holding on to the mattress this way and we drove out to some place. <laughs> but anyway, we just got to be friends. And, um, and then Eleanor, you know, introduced me to a lot of her friends and Tony and eventually her family and then I got to know other people and so Really, um, we worked on things together that were important in the community. And, um, and it started with friendships. You know, we'd be at Eleanor's house, and then we did Christmas parties together. Or not that on Christmas, but parties before Christmas, singing together. And certainly through Clinica Compassina, a lot of the people, um, C's or T's, and um, Eleanor, and um, many of the people who were a part of that, Inez Bugs and all the early folks with Clinica. And then when I had the opportunity as county commissioner to work more with Clinica, make sure they had funding and they had location, 
it was an extension of that. And so when the Boulder Valley schools were looking for a name for the school in Lafayette, I was happy to suggest that it could be Alicia. Mm -hmm. And we lobbied the school board. And you know, I had never really lobbied the school board on anything. And so I was so happy when they made that choice. So Eleanor was certainly probably my first contact, but then the, it expanded and, and got to know um, Evaldo and uh, Phil Hernandez and, and probably as early as early 80s, we were working on you know, demonstrating when there were some things and you know, I have gone up on different marches just to be a part of it and support it. Wonderful. Can you just tell us a little bit about how the Community Foundation is supporting the Boulder Latino History Project? Yeah. Well, I'm first really so excited about the project and a little dismayed that in 2013 that they're just, this is just happening now. It should have happened so long ago. But I'm pleased they are. And um, when Marjorie McIntosh uh, came to us and talked about her background uh, and her interest in doing something locally, um, Elvita Ramos and I had met with her and I had this idea that maybe we could provide some funding, especially if there would be a way to engage young people so that it would be kind of a dual learning that not only, first of all, most of us in our age don't have nearly the skill set that they do to know how to film this and how to have a good setting and how to have the digital and media capabilities. So it would be a two-way street. And so we were able to find some funding to help make it happen. And I'm just so proud that it has just blossomed. Well, we certainly appreciate the funding. Um, We've come to the time where, um, is there any topic or anything you want to elaborate more on before we end the interview? Uh -huh. I think it would be to talk about the assets and the resources that I think the Latino community has for Boulder County. It provides a richness and a um, cultural vibrancy that enhances our lives. So. I think as we look at how we tell the story of what Latinos bring here, um, it puts a, a magnifying glass on it that sometimes many in this community have been such selfless caregivers and such good people that their story hasn't been promoted in the way that it deserves. So I'm, I'm really pleased just to be a part of um, these stories are rich in themselves, and the only role I've had is to really help maybe provide a channel so others can know more about it. And that's, I'm glad we could do that. Thank you, Josie Heath, for taking the time out for this um, oral history, and we certainly appreciate it. Good. Thank you. So good. And I, how nice that you can <laughs> do this. Thank you. Thank you. Well,